Welcome to the first in a series of three videos on the ideas general introduction to pure phenomenology by Edmund Husserl. This video will focus on the first roughly one third of that book. This is, if you have your own copy, the first section, Nature and Knowledge of Essential Being, and the second section, Fundamental um, Phenomenological Outlook. Now, since this is uh, literally one of the most difficult uh, texts in the history of Western philosophy, and because it's a, an unusually maybe dense text as well, it was simply impractical to uh, do the whole book as one video as I had uh, made the attempt to do. Um, so I, I'm going to have to do this as three videos. The next video will focus kind of on the methodological section distinguishing phenomenological methodology from say axiomatic geometric methodology or maybe from the descriptive um, methodology of the natural sciences. And then the uh, third section of the book, well, not the third section literally, uh, but the th last one third of the book dealing with uh, Noema Noesis, a very difficult section of the book, I'll, I'll say for video three. And this way, I'm just going to focus on the first two sections, um, which is in a lot of ways kind of the most successful part of the book. And I want to talk about the difficulty of Husserl now. I've noticed that there's a lot of people who maybe will um, mention Husserl as a, as a historical figure in passing by saying something to the effect of, uh, you know, we have this subjectivism from, from Descartes to Husserl, that's where it ends, I think is one of Judith Butler's arguments um, without going into really any more detail than that. And oftentimes you, it's brought up with Heidegger, uh, people might say something like, um, you know, Husserl and Heidegger had this phenomenological outlook without going into um, more detail. And he's one of the a, a remarkably underread philosophers, along with like Thomas Aquinas, I think suffers a lot from people knowing about them historically without actually delving into reading the text. And that is largely because of the difficulty of both of those thinkers. Um, I think most people, who, even who are interested in philosophy, um, really don't have a full appreciation of just how rigorous both of these thinkers are because their texts are sort of labyrinthine and monumentally um, difficult and rigorous. And that's why I want to uh, try to make the um, neglect of actually reading these books, something can be overcome by doing a series of, of videos where we actually sort of function kind of almost as like a reader's guide as well, going through the text to maybe um, bring uh, some enthusiasm to actually reading it. And I want to talk about the, the difficulty that has led to the neglect of the worst of role is being d different from the, the difficulty of other philosophers. So you have some philosophers who are difficult because of a remarkable obscurity in linguistic style. I think like the German idealists kind of fit into this model. People like Fichte and Schelling um, are, um, I think, maybe more difficult to read than they could have been. There is a way to phrase the ideas of Fichte um, in a much, much more accessible way than you'll find if you actually read Fichte. If you look at my video on the philosophy of Fichte, you'll see that he could have phrased them much more accessibly than he does, but I understand that's part of the spirit of German idealism, is to fall into this type of obscurity of language, which I arguably also find in, in deconstructive work, not only in, in the works of Jacques Derrida, also figures like Judith Butler and Homi Baba in my own in video series on, on, on those figures say that, you know, the ideas of, of Judith Butler are not quite as difficult as they appear to be because of the spirit of deconstructivism to go into this obscurity of style. I don't really think that's what Husserl does. His difficulty is not so much in this obscurity of style, it's uh, rather for the fact that he, he never really feels the need to appear to be quite as complicated as he really is. It's the remarkable thing about him is he's actually trying to avoid unnecessary obscurity in language and present ideas um, that are remarkably complicated in the simplest way possible, and yet still a remarkably difficult work. And then there's the other kind of difficulty, which is maybe the linear difficulty of someone like uh, Bertrand Russell or, or a lot of other analytic philosophies in which you don't have this uh, intentional obfuscation. In fact, Bertrand Russell um, really goes out of his way to present his ideas clearly, but he also presents them, I think, rather linearly, in which he kind of starts out with these fundamentals. And if you do the hard work of going through one of Russell's texts, you're able to build up linearly more and more complicated results in the same way that like a mathematics textbook will linearly build up that difficulty. I don't think that 
that's really what you have with Husserl. Um, he does have something of a, of a logical methodology to him, and yet it's not simply a linear concatenation of more and more complicated results, which are, um, if you do the hard work, easy to trace along. It's rather that he's talking about things as clearly as he can which almost nobody else has ever thought about. Uh, one characterization of Husserl is that he was concerned mostly with problems that almost nobody else has, has thought was a problem, um, which is another reason for his, his neglect, is a lot of people, I think, who might have otherwise wanted to read something about him, he's simply dealing with problems in like logical investigations, which are not of concern to uh, somebody to, to pick something up to, uh, to use in their reading of, of the X-Men or, or some um, uh, novel or Hollywood film. And uh, that's, uh, I think, one of the, the great difficulties about him um, is he's simply treading into territory that nobody else is going into. So I want to um, maybe just cut right to the text itself. Now, the intro about what is pure phenomenology anyway that I have sort of set up as this first slide, I wanted to illustrate with the example um, of the difference between a, a orange traffic cone and a geometry about it. Now, let me just check real quick to make sure that the slide is working and looks like it is. And uh, thank you, everybody who is uh, who is uh, tuned in. Let me go ahead and resume this. So, what is pure phenomenology anyway? So, phenomenology is a term that's older than Husserl. We obviously know about like the phenomenology of spirit by Hegel, although that was not the original title um, of that work. By the way, as I talked about in another video, um, but phenomenology is kind of like the science of um, of experience is the informal way to put it, and it certainly is a science. Of Experience. And yet it's also not just another science about a regional concern of types of objects that's listed along with all the others. It's not just one in a list of geology studies, you know, um, earth type rock stuff, uh, biology studies, living things, phenomenology studies, experience. It's not like that. It has a unique position relative to all the other sciences. And that's because phenomenology is not merely a sort of empirical study of experiences which all too easily could be confused with psychology. In fact, many people miss the point about phenomenology say, well, why don't you just let the psychologists do that? At least they're doing it scientifically, if by that you mean with the natural science method. Um, but phenomenology is not psychology. And the difference between phenomenology and psychology can be understood through a type of analogy of geometry and natural science. He says himself, phenomenology is through psychology, which is the study of um, experiences of the brain as this naturally occurring thing. Um, basically, the brain is a lump of flesh which can do stuff, including having experiences of psychology. But phenomenology is to psychology what geometry is to natural science. And if you have the example of an orange traffic cone and a cone as represented um, in geometry, as you see on the top of the screen, um, one question I would ask you real quick is what's the difference? What's the difference? They're both cones. One of them is an actual orange traffic cone. Let's just say you see this on the side of a road on the interstate uh, somewhere in Oklahoma City where there's uh, a lot of uh, road work going on last time I was living there. Um, and then you have the geometrical um, uh, cone as this type of abstraction. And he said that the difference between um, maybe an a posteriori, although, although he largely avoids those terms, but uh, for the sake of familiarity with Kant, I'm going to start the presentation with these terms. Just between the a posteriori observation of a real traffic cone, like the orange traffic cone, versus the a priori knowledge about cones in general, or rather, not so much cones in general as the purified cone. The difference between the bottom one and the top one is largely a matter of purity. The top one, as the geometrical cone, as such, has a level of idealistic purity, or um, maybe a type of transcendental purification, right? At least for Kant would agree with that, that the, the bottom one doesn't. And there, it's not that there's no relation, it's just that the concern of the natural scientist to go out archiving facts about stuff that occurs a posteriori is not the same as the concern of, um, say, the geometer who is studying uh, the, the purified concept of the triangle with a level of a priori necessity and a priori certainty, which is simply not to be confused with that. But he says that it's not just a matter, as Kant would think, about 
maybe retreating into the type of ideality of, say, pure aesthetic form of space and time to learn about um, like geometrical truths or retreating into the abstraction of the categories, as Kant would hold, that there is a type of abstraction of pure concepts like um, that you get with substance as endurance over time or cause and effect as this type of a priori relation um, rather than something you just observe empirically, which is almost like for Kant to retreat into the set of um, intellectual resources which the transcendental subject has but are not a part of the world. Whereas for phenomenology, the, um, the the beautiful thing is you're not so much retreating into abstraction to discover these sort of a priori essentialities. Rather, you're taking an outlook on what stands right before your eyes, but by achieving a break from the natural attitude, which I'll talk about in much greater depth later, you achieve this type of transcendental purification without losing anything. It's not that you're um, using this as a template and then dropping it in order to move, as Kant largely did, from you know uh, cause and effect observed in, in, in reality to the pure concept of cause and effect. We're moving from a straight line you see really to the pure form of uh, geometry. Um, it's rather for whose role you're not dropping anything or losing anything, but by a change in your attitude, you're allowing what was actually given rather, rather unproblematically to be given as such without the type of unnecessary obfuscation that the natural attitude largely accounted for. So this is going to rest on a huge distinction he makes beginning of the book uh, between fact and essence. Now, psychology, for those who say phenomenology is a waste of time, just let, just let the psychologists um, handle it. Um, th that's um, only true if you misunderstand the difference between fact and essence thoroughly. Psychology is a science of facts. It's a science of facts about the brain. Ultimately, if you take the brain as this super literal like lump of flesh, which has a certain set of abilities of things that it can do, and you study that, you're, you might be able to compile a lot of facts about it. But phenomenology is not a science of facts. It simply is not that type of science. It's an eidetic science of essential being. Now, the word eidetic, I mean, is kind of transliterated from ancient Greek. I think that the difference between um, Husserl and Heidegger is Heidegger was largely interested, from my own reading of both of them, in uh, going to ordinary, uh, uh, everyday German uh, language and um, to talk about the the kind of stuff that he didn't have the terminology for from the philosophical tradition from like the Middle Ages. Whose role is not so much interested, for the most part, in going to ordinary everyday German. He rather sort of borrows words from ancient Greek. Um, you have uh, Eidos, Aidos here, which is kind of uh, the word for form, image, shape. If you just pull out a Greek lexicon, those are the words you'll get. Um, he talks about hyletic uh, data later on as kind of like sense contents. And he kind of borrows words from classical uh, language. Um, to talk about stuff which does need a type of technical term. So here, um, what he means by the eidos is kind of a pure essence, but it's not a pure essence which is just a, uh, a linguistic sentence that tells you in words explicitly what it is. It's not a functional ideality like what you get with um, with uh, Frege and Russell where you have this type of functional ideality of things like concepts as just providing the relation between an object and a truth value. Um, it's not a syntactic construct, which you just build up um, in a well-formed string. It's rather something which is seen. That's the bizarre thing about who's and the thing that is all too easy to miss about phenomenology is if you get the pure essence, it's something which is given intuitively. And the eidetic reduction is what moves you from something factually empirical to a type of essential universality. And this is really hinging on a, a very important distinction, which will be much more important in the later section of the book, between the real and the not real. Psychology studies something real, which is a brain, which is a real thing. But phenomenology deals with the not real essences. Now, he's not saying that they're not real in the sense that they're um, and they're uh, imaginatively constructed with no uh, more basis than um, the fact that somebody made them up or whatever. By not real, he's simply saying that the kind of reality of the brain as a physical object is not the same kind of makeup 
of the essences which phenomenology studies because um, all transcendentally purified experiences, if they've been properly purified, lead you to non-realities um, because you're going beyond the contingency of fact, transcending that to essential universality. And therefore, the real brain um, is something which you can document maybe a number of empirical facts about. And yet, if you transcend the um, limitations of staying in the natural attitude, you can move from empirical facts about the real brain, like what would it do under these circumstances, which is a lot of what psychology does is uh, basically put people in, uh, in the, uh, the rat cage and uh, expose them to stimuli to see how they react and deduce their instincts. Whereas there's another maybe much pure knowledge in that, and that is, for example, the perspectival givenness that all physical objects have. And for an example of that, um, since I don't really have an animation here, I'll just show you like all of the sides of the same die. Now the same die is uh, pictured there in um, six different partial perspectives, each one showing you um, a different side, but it's the same die. And it is the essence really of spatial, physical, uh, spatial temporal physical objects that they're only ever given perspectively. <clears throat> Excuse me, that is not the limitation of that die per se. It's rather something which characterizes all um, things which are of the same type as that. And that sort of essential knowledge, which is not just knowledge about that die or not just knowledge about this box that has the same, uh, falls prey to the same law, rather a, a knowledge about the essence of the stuff you're talking about. That's what really interests Husserl. And therefore, you have this movement where you're not so much breaking away from empirical intuition of fact and retreating into abstraction um, or speculation. Rather, you have this transformation of empirical intuition of fact into essential insight, and he calls this ideation. And the bizarre thing about phenomenology is there's no need to drop anything from experience to try to build up these ideas linguistically. Rather, Everything you're interested in is caught up in a type of insight. And the object of that insight is something like a pure essence or an aidos, as, as he uh, takes the word from ancient Greek. And for the reason that what you're talking about here is a type of insight, and uh, what you're um, uh, directed towards is a type of object, you have to extend the definitions of intuition and object far beyond what someone like, say, Kant was interested in, in that Theodos is still an object, and essential insight is still a type of intuition. This is why in the early Husserl, in, say, um, uh, logical investigations, you have this notion that categorical um, relations, which are usually thought of as having to be built up with the resources of logical syntax, like relations to the effect of, you know, the, the, the laptop is on the table. Um, he says, you know, the, the relation that you, you think needs to be built up with, uh, with logical syntax is actually given intuitively, this type of categorical intuition in which it's already in intuition that you have these sort of higher order logical relations. You just have to maybe extend the concept of intuition and extend the concept of object to uh, be open to that. Therefore, geometry is uh, a type of eidetic science that studies ideal possibilities and not actualities with an essential insight into essential relationships. And uh, phenomenology is also an eidetic science. Phenomenology is um, a faith in and an interest in things which would become wildly unpopular in the later 20th century. Someone like Judith Butler would never be interested in a type of establishment of an eidetic science that retreats from actuality. So I, that's the wrong word. It, it transcends mere actuality in order to gain essential insight into essential relations. That becomes very unpopular with like post-structuralism. But that was what Husserl was quite interested in. And you misunderstand what phenomenology is if you miss out on that fact. Um, I saw one really ridiculous uh, monograph when I was in grad school called um, like Husserl and Darwin, why like, Husserl is the real naturalist. And it's like, that might be the politically correct thing to say today, which is he's just interested in the naturalist reduction of everything to biological organisms, but it's a wildly untruthful, dishonest uh, take on somebody who obviously was interested in something rather different than the naturalist reduction of, um, of phenomenology. Ultimately, that would be true psychology. Uh, but enough about uh, that monograph. I want to 
talk now about a super important distinction in formal and material ontology. You know, this just plays a role in Heidegger's being in time. I'll argue that a lot of uh, being in time won't make, per, uh, won't make the right kind of sense unless you uh, keep this distinction in, in mind since um, you know, Heidegger was largely following as the disciple of Husserl, and this is what he was particularly um, critiquing. And the, the difference between formal and material ontology kind of goes to the difference in Aristotle between formal and material cause. You have, obviously, material cause telling you what of the elements it's made of. Is it made of, um, basically, uh, earth, fire, wind, air are the ancient Greek elements, and it, you have this makeup of elements, um, but that is less uh, instructive, says Aristotle, than the formal cause. I mean, if you really want to know what something is, you're not going to find it as this ultimate material makeup underneath uh, the form. You're rather going to find it as something meaningful in form. And it, it's not that Husserl agrees with that particular formulation, but he does adopt these uh, distinctions between formal and material ontology um, in a kind of more sophisticated way to talk about the way that for um, Material ontology, if I skip down here first, you have this set of non-overlapping, as he calls them, regions of types of objects which are distinguished from one another by essential distinctions. Let me talk about the difference between essence and fact, um, and not so much factual distinctions, it's essential distinctions. For example, physical objects are perspectively given. You can only see one set of a die at a time, uh, but you can't universalize that to other things which are given. Psychic acts are not given perspectively. You don't just see one, per one side of them at a time, um, he says later on in the book that feelings are not given that way. You don't see one side. If you're feeling sadness, you don't see one side of it at a time. Laws or a priori laws are not given with a perspective. You see only one, one side of it at a time. Um, but that is the essence of physics, spatial temporal physical objects. And um, therefore, in material ontology, you have this establishment of, of regions um, for which the, there is a type of um, fitting of, of an object within one of these regions. And if you have um, a set of regions that do not have an ultimate like super region encompassing all of them, you avoid the mistake of uh, trying to um, uh, bring the um, all of the different regions under one heading that would be inappropriate. So for example, you have the region of spatial temporal physical objects. Um, you have the region of psychic events. You have the region of, um, like you talked about, the region of pure consciousness, etc. cetera. Um, there is a distinction between like empirical consciousness, which is what psychology focuses on, and then absolute consciousness is something distinguished from that, which actually provides the sort of constitution of its own, which is one of the problems of recursion, the Jacques Derrida um, critiques. But I mean, that's um, distinct from uh, the critique of formal ontology, which um, rather than pinning down the region, basically, that that object uh, belongs to, you instead have the, the need for uh, this type of resource to talk about an, an anonymous any object whatsoever. Um, and what would you talk about if you were talking about this anonymous any object whatsoever? There'd be things like logical categories. He lists out um, things like property, things like whole and part, things like relation, things like identity of the object, uh, things like number, things like collection. Um, things like genus and species. These are ways of talking about um, any object whatsoever, irrespective of which particular material ontological genus, or I should say region, it is, um, a, a, it is from. And therefore, that's where you have that distinction. Um, and he, he, he's going to argue in chapter two, the naturalistic misconstructions, um, which makes this stupid monograph about uh, Husserl being the true heir to Darwin all the more um, ridiculous is that right here's actually warning against naturalistic misconstructions. But anyway, second year about launching a new beginning rather than borrowing from established philosophy, kind of the way that um, Heidegger was also more interested in not correcting the use of, uh, you know, uh, uh, established terminology from the history of philosophy as using um, uh, sort of launching a new beginning altogether. And we see the same thing here, which is why Husserl might sound like empiricism, and yet he uh, devotes a lot of time both in logical investigations and in, in the ideas to um, showing all of the ways that phenomenology is not simply empiricism, because empiricism largely is just the exploration of facts. And it largely ignores any knowledge about essential being. Um, but phenomenology doesn't 
focus on essential being to the exclusion of experience, it actually goes into the same type of experience as empiricism does, but it goes into it not in this pursuit of empirical facts. Rather, it extends the meaning of the German word sein, which is German for seeing, to have a much broader meaning, just as it extends the meaning of object, be far broader. And therefore, he says that phenomenologists are actually the genuine positivists, because the positivists who focus on um, what's given to uh, to experience is what is the distinguishing mark of of uh, of a positivist who argue that you can only study facts and not essences because facts are given to consciousness but essences are not that's where he's going to particularly um disagree in the sense that um you know phenomenology is uh, using experience and using seeing to delve into the essences, which if you have the right attitude, actually are given intuitively. So anyway, he says that psychology deals with concepts, but it makes the mistake of treating those concepts as either abstractions or mental productions. So the psychology that was prevalent, at least at his time in like the early 20th century in Germany, talked about concepts as these type of mental productions. So the brain, I guess, as, as a physical object has the ability to, um, I guess, uh, you know, generate concepts as abstractions for stuff that's actually encountered. But um, essential knowledge that Husserl is interested in is certainly not, not anything like a mental production or an abstraction from the data. It's rather something that is given to intuition with an objectivity much broader than that. And therefore, for Kant, um, the a priori is something like a pure subjective form. You have the sort of a priori givenness of, of uh, the spatial coordinate system, which gives you the validity of geometrical truths and Kant, like a straight line is shortest distance between two points, but it's really a subjective form. For Kant, that's not um, as it would be for Isaac Newton, something absolute that would be that same spatial grid, even if there were no minds, is Isaac Newton's take on it. For Kant, it is subjective, or it's a type of concept which um, is also kind of inwardly subjective, like the pure concept of substance, the pure concept of cause and effect. But for Husserl, you're not so much um, going into pure subjectivity to deduce uh, these sort of a priori concerns. Rather, you're, it's more like you're discovering them in intuition as something given rather than something merely subjectively constructed or whatever. And therefore, this is going to require, above anything else, a type of different outlook <coughs> and a different standpoint. And what that's going to mean negatively is the suspension of the natural attitude, which is normally given. So the natural attitude, a super important uh, term for Husserl, is um, the way that we usually take for granted that we have this attitude towards experience, which we don't usually explicitly phrase this way, but if you really um, scratch the surface, this is what it is. The natural attitude is that you are an observer who's situated within a world, kind of like this world. We kind of take for granted that we're situated somewhere in this world. So I live in India, so I'm all the way like down here. Okay, you're probably either somewhere in Europe or maybe you're in Russia or <clears throat> maybe in Dubai or North America, wherever. Um, and we're within a world, but that world is taken for granted as being spread out over space and time. And it's populated by the sprawling set of physical objects, which are distributed and have this endurance, even when they're not paid attention to. So in addition to what's given to you experience literally for you at the moment, you would take for granted, obviously there's all kinds of other stuff out there in the world, which is enduring. And this is the attitude of, of natural scientists. It's, in fact, it's the attitude that a, a natural scientist of like botany, it's the, the attitude they should have. I mean, Husserl's not necessarily saying that, um, you know, a botanist would gain much from suspending the kind of attitude that makes their work possible. But um, it is, at the end of the day, still an attitude. And you might take another attitude, like you might take the um, the arithmetical standpoint when you're doing some type of number crunching, uh, but that's a temporary adoption of an attitude. And he says that even if you temporarily adopt the arithmetical standpoint, that does not cancel out the natural standpoint. <coughs> Excuse me, because that is going to endure without having to be explicitly adopted. It's not that you take up the natural attitude and then it kind of vanishes when you stop explicitly positing it. It's rather just the kind of natural background, which it's a matter of work to suspend. And Husserl's not the first one to notice this. He says that Descartes, 
who becomes a wildly unpopular figure in the later 20th century, um, is somebody who Husserl says he's really trying to do phenomenology. Okay, so the same thing Husserl's doing, that's what Descartes was trying to do, because Descartes does give us a method for altering the natural attitude. And I really need to do a whole series of videos on Descartes properly, but the big thing, if you haven't read uh, Descartes, or if it's been a while, is he uh, uses um, something like doubt. He said, I might be aware of something like, in my case, there's a coffee mug right in front of me. Uh, but if I suspend the attitude of taking for granted that it's real and that it's there, I can enter into doubt and move from stuff that's only partially certain to things that are completely certain. Like, main one is that I exist. Like, even if there's no coffee mug in front of me, I think. Therefore, I must exist. So the thing that you really got to keep in mind here is that suspension of the natural attitude, which is, for whose rule, explicitly suspending this taken for granted of the natural attitude is you as an observer situated within a world spread out over space and time, populated by physical objects, etc., cetera, um, which, are, which are taken for granted also ontologically as being the type of natural things that would be situated in such a world. If you suspend it, you're not negating anything. So here's the super crucial thing is um, suspension is not negation. Negation or subtraction or denial of givens is not what you do there. In fact, nothing is actually lost. You don't subtract any of the givenness um, that uh, was before uh, taken for granted. Instead, you simply put out of use the attitude or standpoint on it, which frees you up to um, notice a lot of things that you would be blind to if you didn't do so. So in chapter two, he moves on to consciousness and natural reality in that the natural attitude, which we just suspended, would make consciousness into a brain event. And to this day, um, a lot of the things that Husserl was interested in are still interests to people who are psychologists. But because they don't find it necessary at all to break with the natural attitude, they just take for granted that Consciousness is just a brain event. It's a thing which the brain as a physical object can do. It can be conscious. And I would argue that even to a large extent, um, the, the Catherine Malibu crowd, Adrian Johnson, last time I read his work, uh, these, these sort of materialists um, who, who adopt Hegel to talk about uh, things like the brain, they really kind of are still treating it the same way as the mystery of, you know, why evolutionarily speaking did the brain um, Missing, uh, go, going to uh, end up in a position, I should say, I really got to choose my words carefully, in which there was uh, something like consciousness, which was, by many accounts, more expensive in terms of energy and resources for the body than it was worth, that did not make you maybe more functional, but still had a type of achievement of hegemony over the body uh, that was kind of like phrasing a healing terms. That's still thing we're granted that consciousness is kind of a thing which the brain does. Uh, but uh, that's the natural attitude. And uh, for phenomenology, um, consciousness is not just a thing the brain does because you, you have something like a unique region there because it's the only region that is unaffected by the suspension of the natural attitude. Okay, so the only region which remains unaffected after you do that is consciousness. And therefore, you have to... Um, stop talking about inner and outer perceptions and you have to adopt the terminology of imminent and transcendent perceptions. Uh, for example, you have imminently directed acts, which are acts that are recursively related to acts. And then you have transcendent directed acts, which uh, transcend towards things like essences, things like things, things like other egos experience streams themselves. Um, I have like Husserl's uh, notion in, in logical investigations of, uh, in, in, in language and communication, there is a type of indication of somebody else's thought. As you observing it, somebody else, you can have something like a transcendent directed act towards their experience stream. Um, and it does matter, therefore, uh, contrary to expectation, the veridicity of experience. Now, that's kind of a technical term, which is actually pulled from psychology, I believe, in which obviously there's all kinds of people who report paranormal um, observations. For example, I have an image here of the Loch Ness Monster, um, which, you know, even though we know that this image, um, well, actually, I'll, I'll hold off on describing this image for a moment, um, but we, we, there's all kinds of people who, who claim that they've seen Bigfoot, they've seen the Loch Ness Monster, they've seen dinosaurs. Um, there's a uh, creationist pastor who um, 
uh, would actually go around the country interviewing people who claimed, like, yeah, I totally saw a dinosaur. And the thing you got to keep in mind is whether they're correct or whether it's a hallucination or an illusion, there is something like an experience there. The difference the psychologist would say is that a, an experience for which the object of experience really exists is a veridic experience. Okay, this is kind of a fake word from, um, in, in French, la vérité is uh, the truth. So it's a truthful experience. And the, and the criteria for truth is um, the presence of the object is confirmed. So you can intend an object and it would be veridic, ex ignore that um, uh, misspelling typo, um, if the presence of the object is really confirmed, okay? So you might have something like uh, an object of perception like a table, which is transcended to the perception. And we know that it's transcendent because as a thing, it exceeds even an infinite number of partial perspectives on it. You could go around and survey every single um, partial perspective on the object and you still have this type of excess of the thing beyond all of its partial perspectives. And it's also transcendent in the sense it'll endure even if you leave it. Um, and the uh, big deal, therefore, for an object which is transcendent to consciousness is the presence of it as being real is what leads to it being a veridic experience. And this uh, notion of, uh, of, of a veridic experience really having its object as present really just applies to reality. Um, Consciousness and reality, although psychology uh, conflates the two, really have to be held to different standards because they have different ways of being. Um, so the, the measure of reality and presence that you have with something like the Loch Ness Monster, which although this, uh, this image is obviously known to be a hoax, there are still many people who claim to have seen the Loch Ness Monster. Okay? And I'm not going to say that they're wrong. Okay, uh, That's a whole other debate. But um, uh, we have, at the very least, a... a a need to drop the Kantian um, distinction between mere appearance and the thing in itself, in whose role we actually do see the thing in itself. And we avoid the image theory, as whose role cause, calls it, in which appearance is merely an image of this other thing, which it's a secondary representation of, um, which leads to infinite recursion. And he says that one of the reasons we can avoid it is because we can hold the standard of embodiedness as kind of a test of the veridicity of an experience. If it's given in embodied form, as he calls it, in bodily presence, kind of going back to Aristotle's ancient Greek term of the soma. Now that's kind of been abused in modern transliteration to talk about like if you have it if you have like a disease with bodily origin elements, you would talk about the somatic causes of the disease, whatever. Um, but really soma for uh, Aristotle in the metaphysics is talking about bodies which have this type of physical presence. And I think that's why, although it's not a, a necessarily um, at the fourth of which thing, I think in phenomenology, we could, we could do well to adopt this concept of the soma from ancient Greek as the standard of the embodiedness or bodily presence of the transcendent object, which if you have a hallucination, you don't have the embodied form. You, know, you see things that aren't really there. Um, just like that really creepy video of uh, the girl in the hotel in Los Angeles or wherever it was, who um, is, uh, they, they caught her on camera in the, in the elevator, um, uh, hiding and, and, and uh, stepping in and out of the elevator and, and hiding from somebody who, but you can't see anyone in the hall. So there's the question, was she hallucinating? Was she on drugs? Later on, she was found dead in a dumpster. Did, is the killer just not seen in the video by us, which it really was somebody there? That's a big question, which hinges on the veridicity of the experience of the girl in the elevator who was later either killed or maybe she died because she was on drugs. That's the big mystery of um, that video. Uh, but anyway, uh, this leads to maybe talking about essence and experience. And let me just go ahead and double check because uh, the internet uh, was not working in this um, house uh, recently, and we just got it back yesterday, so I just kind of want to make sure that this is still um, working. So, okay, looks good to me. So, got a couple of comments here. Okay. Okay, so no audio. Can somebody please confirm to me uh, that there is sound? Uh, actually, let me just turn on the sound here. Okay, so no audio. Okay, so that works. Um, what's the difference between phenomenology of Hegel and phenomenology of Husserl? What is phenomenalism? Okay, 
Great question, Himanshu Gupta. Let me um, get to those uh, questions in, um, I'll just do it right now. So uh, phenomenology for Hegel um, is not the science that encompasses his work as a whole. I think that's really more like dialectic, which is why phenomenology of spirit is not maybe the most foundational word for Hegel. Um, in a lot of ways, the, the logic um, takes a, a more generalized starting point than phenomenology because phenomenology of spirit for Hegel starts with what's immediate to consciousness, which is sense con uh, or sense perception, sense consciousness, I should say, um, sense certainty, there we go, sorry about that. Um, and, but the logic starts in a more general standpoint with being. So the difference between being as a starting point and sense certainty as a starting point shows that for Hegel, phenomenology is not the term to encompass his entire body of work the way that it is for Husserl. It's rather that that particular book takes us on the journey what, of what happens within consciousness of dialectic, but dialectic is kind of more general. So that's the first difference. Um, phenomenalism is a kind of pejorative term that uh, Sartre um, gives to Husserl as saying, well, he's not really doing phenomenology, he's just doing phenomenalism, because phenomenalism is kind of the negative charge of experience as focusing on mere appearance. Okay, so that's what you don't want to be, as somebody who focuses merely on the, um, the experience in terms of appearances, right? Uh, and, and not transcending deeper. I think that's a very unfair way to characterize Husserl's work. And I don't really think that Sartre's critiques of Husserl um, hold, very much, uh, uh, hold very much validity. So, I mean, if we wanna talk about going beyond mere appearance, an example on the slide, right, uh, with essence and experience. Um, even God, says Husserl, cannot alter essences just like God cannot alter two plus two equals four. There's a type of accountability even of God to those kinds of truths. And essences are like mathematical truths like two plus two equals four. And one thing you can get is the difference in, um, in um, essences between different types of givennesses. So he gives the idea that like the essence of a, a guy is to be given only one perspective at a time, but essences of feeling are not really that way. So like if you have a feeling of sadness, um, the essence of that feeling is not to be given one partial perspective. You only see one side of it at a time, and you got to kind of got to move around to see the rest. It's not like that. And that's why for him, essence has priority over existence. And existence anyway is just the correlate of essence. So unlike maybe the materialist like um, Catherine Malibu or Adrian Johnston who take um, material existence as their starting point and would rule out a priority of essence as something like a mystical like superstition, which properly like hardcore materialists will do away with. Um, it's a popular idea in the late 20th, early 21st century, but that's not what Husserl was interested in. <coughs> Excuse me, friend. Essence has the priority. And when you talk about things which exist, um, you, you can do so insofar as they're correlates of essences. Um, and this is kind of like for Thomas Aquinas, form has a priority over matter. Um, you understand if you take form, not merely if you understand in terms of either the contingent fact that it's materially embodied, which is why you can actually understand things which are not materially embodied. Like it, material embodiment is not a condition of understanding for Thomas Aquinas. You can understand things with no material embodiment, even things which maybe don't exist uh, anyway, like unicorns, you can still sort of understand intellectually what they are by taking form without matter. Um, and that's kind of like what Husserl does. He's, he's actually, if you wanna know what thinker he's most like, it's actually Aristotle. Um, and therefore, the being of consciousness is um, different than the reality thingliness of the, the thing world, uh, nice mouthful there, um, because, Consciousness in its being survives the nullification of the thing world. Even if you do the Cartesian suspension of um, natural reality, you still have the being of consciousness surviving um, as unaffected. And this is the difference between the presumptive reality of the thing. If you have something like the Loch Ness Monster, I'm going to presume if I see that, you know, one dark, uh, misty, foggy evening, if I see that, I'm going to presume that it's real, but I'm not sure, versus the absolute reality of myself, in which I can't just presume the existence of myself, I'm absolutely certain of it. And this leads to a crucial distinction between transcendent and transcendental. Um, one of the biggest um, errors of maybe people new to philosophy is to confuse the words transcendent and transcendental. And they're only, um, 
distinguished by two letters, so that's an, uh, a clear mistake. I think that it would have been better in retrospect to choose a word uh, other than transcendental, to talk about the transcendental because of, of that reason, but just something is transcendent if it's outside. Like uh, there's a tree on the outside, which I can see as a transcendent object, right? Transcendental is not that, it's rather for, for Kant anyway, uh, not a property of the thing in itself, it's something like a pure form. And it's purified form because it's not a property of a transcendent thing, rather it's a type of validity which goes beyond it. And therefore, um, the meaning of the word being is usually attributed to like the thing world, right? The standard of being is things. Whereas for who's real, it's going to be inverted from the world of things to consciousness. You really want to talk about a standard of being which gives priority to consciousness, not as just one more thing in the world, but with a different type of under, uh, attention to being. And that's because transcendental has priority over transcendent in the same way that essence has priority over existence. In fact, it's really kind of the same thing. Um, it, it, as as um, <clears throat> um, difficult as it is to, uh, you know, uh, try not to make mistakes with blending terms. Um, what I'm trying to say here is something that is existing transcendently, right? Um, and something which is transcendentally purified or the same, it's, it's a very similar kind of distinction. Therefore, reality has no absolute essence, okay? Only, only unintentional only an intentional essence. Um, so reality's essence is not absolute. It's merely intentional in the sense of uh, being object of experience. And for the field of consciousness is not just a portion of nature, like the brain is just one piece of all of nature. The, it's just a piece of the world. Um, in fact, it is actually not a contradiction to talk about incorporeal, incorporeal consciousness. That's to say consciousness with uh, taking the being of consciousness without having to subordinate that to the physical body in which, for example, the brain is encased. Something you would talk about without contradiction. Um, psychology only concerns itself <coughs> with uh, sort of the, uh, the empirical unities of contingent fact um, of a type of, but that's merely of an intentional constitution which you get from consciousness kind of intentionally constituting the achievement of it. But the all unities of meaning, even beyond just those that psychology concerns with, um, actually presuppose the sense giving consciousness for their achievement. And therefore, to speak of that reality as being absolute, when in fact you have to sort of achieve uh, the intentional constitution of it with the help of consciousness is to talk about something like a round square. It's, it's, it's an absurdity to talk about absolute reality because of this unique position we found consciousness hold. Therefore, in chapter four, the phenomenological reductions, you have the disconnection of the natural world. Um, you uh, disconnect the presumption of yourself as situated within a natural world. You disconnect the presumption that those are just natural things occurring within that world, etc. Um, and you don't also get help from established disciplines in mathematics. It's not that you subordinate phenomenology to some established body of doctrine in one of the mathematical disciplines and you recruit extra help from them to clarify. Um, you disconnect eidetic geometry because it's dealing with the transcendent rather than something purely transcendental is one of the things he says. And you study instead in the light pure intuition. And phenomenology is this universal science, therefore, doesn't recruit the aid of some other um, established mathematical discipline because as universal science, phenomenology encloses the other eidetic disciplines rather than recruits them as the basis for itself. And therefore, stay tuned for the next video on methodology and then the video after that on the noema, the noesis, etc. And I will um, go to the live stream um, chat right now and see if there are any other uh, concerns. And thank you, uh, by the way, uh, everybody for watching. So, okay, how does Husserlian phenomenology, this is from Andrew Stodge Hill. How does Husserlian phenomenology differ from platonic forms? Aren't they both abstracting from the objects encountered? Hey, that's a great question. Um, I think that Husserl and Plato are not nearly as incompatible as so many other thinkers might be. Um, I think that 
in the case of, of Plato, you are interested not just in the kind of contingent knowledge of, um, of, of facts, right, which was really, as we recall, you really are interested in essences in Plato and in Aristotle, right? Uh, and that's why for Plato, you have this notion of forms. Now, the interesting thing about Plato is you don't get the forms by deducing them as mental constructions or building them up syntactically with language. You get the forms primarily by seeing them. Now, you see them with the superior intuition, which you have as a soul rather than as a body. Um, and the big thing for Plato is even as a soul, when you leave your body, you still have like vision, right? You still have intuition is a better word for it. So you see the forms and you understand what they are because you see them. And you want to talk about really suspending the natural attitude, like leaving your body would definitely do that. Um, so I, I, there's a lot of similarity really between them. Now, when you say that they're both abstracting from ex, uh, experienced uh, stuff, I don't know if that's quite the way that I would put it because when you're abstracting, from it, in my opinion, it's kind of like if you see uh, uh, 20 things that are red and you abstract the pure color redness from those 20 things, you're kind of like um, building this byproduct is the way that I would put it, um, which is, uh, which is uh, separated off from all the stuff. I don't know that that's what either Plato or Husserl would say. I think it's rather that you're um, not so much getting these byproducts of experience as you're penetrating to a deeper and more profound level of experience itself. That's why the allegory of the cave is actually built on this journey of going from more and more inferior types of intuition to more and more superior types of intuition. In, in the cave allegory, you start with seeing stuff. It's just that what you're seeing is inferior. It's shadows on the wall. And then you see the puppets. And then you see the reflections in the pool of water. Then you see things walking around. And, and if you make it all the way up the ladder, you eventually um, will see the forms, which those things are also um, uh, copies of, right? And what you're doing is you're not really looking at all the stuff that's given at any one of those inferior levels and then deducing this mental byproduct to get at truth. You're rather moving simply to superior and, and more superior types of intuition. And therefore, I think that uh, Plato, who does not really feel, the, uh, excuse me, uh, Husserl, who does not really feel the need to uh, launch this vicious attack on phenomenology uh, that, uh, or, excuse me, on, on Plato that uh, so many other, um, oh yeah, yeah, I didn't mean to, uh, you know, uh, uh, split hairs about the terminology, but uh, abstraction. So what is abstraction anyway? Abstraction is maybe something which it doesn't have the same sort of ontological um, certainty as a real thing. Like you see 20 red things and you deduce the color red. Well, the color red doesn't really exist. It's like a mental byproduct. But the forms, I think, really do exist for Plato. Um, and you're certainly moving to a different type of knowledge. Maybe we're saying we're gaining in certainty by going to the forms, but they certainly do exist. Right. Um, and with Husserl, the existence of the essences becomes more complicated because when he talks about existence as being maybe actually dependent on essence or correlative to essence, if you're talking about existence, it's a correlate of, of essence. It's a fairly complicated thing. Um, he's talking really about the existence of, of, of things. Right. We have the essence of spatial, temporal, physical object. Then we have like a die on a table. You're playing games. Right. Uh, that's definitely the type of existence which is secondary to essence. But what about the existence of the essences? This is why um, a lot of like attempts to incorporate Husserl into more modern approaches, um, which are more maybe popular on campus, like naturalism is pretty popular on campus, you know, like to say that Husserl and Darwin are simply saying the same thing about naturalism as intellectually dishonest as that is, is something which is kind of a necessity in the modern academic environment where um, things like um, essences having an existence outside the material is intolerable to people like uh, Adrian Johnston um, who are strict materialists, right? This idea of pure, uh, pure purified essences, um, uh, not just the byproduct of the dialectical materialism of the brain is intolerable to someone like Johnston. And that's because with the trends in thinking 
where we have this truly ridiculous situation now where um, it figures as diverse as Alan Badiou, Judith Butler, and Slavoj Žižek um, all claim the title of materialist, just like Catherine Malibu. Um, they're all materialists. And uh, if anyone could explain to me how set theoretical mathematics is materialist, um, I'd be happy to listen because Alan Badiou does not strike me as a materialist. Um, he, he strikes me as somebody who feels pressured to have to call himself a materialist because it's so unpopular to be accused of being an idealist or uh, to believe in things like platonic forms without being labeled as like a type of mysticism or superstition or whatever. You have to be a materialist. And it ends up being a meaningless word because materialism is radically um, incompatible if you go from Judith Butler talking about um, discursive um, formations, etc., cetera, and, and, and repetitions of stylizations of the body. Um, I guess kind of in a way that's compatible with materialism, but it means something kind of different there than it would strictly for someone like uh, like a Darwinist type of, uh, you know, uh, type of thinker, um, certainly different from someone like Richard Dawkins, different from somebody like Slavoj Žižek or Catherine Malibu. And I think that having the courage to not give into the peer pressure to just call yourself a materialist because everybody else is doing it, it's one of the uh, things that I think you'll have to do if you want to have a serious um, reading of, of, of cultural and of phenomenology. And uh, one thing that will strike you, I think, is also the extent to which um, so many of the casual um, analyses of phenomenology that you find on a college campus these days uh, leave out a lot of this stuff. Like when there was a bit of a phenomenology fad in graduate school, um, when I was in grad school, which, um, you know, uh, people who I'm, I'm pretty sure never read one word by Husserl were uh, adopting phenomenology as their, their, um, their uh, standpoint, right? Their um, theoretical uh, resource phenomenology because a very cursory knowledge of Merleau-Ponty would lead you to uh, type of, uh, a type of understanding of overcoming Cartesian dualism is one of the ways that phenomenology has been utterly abused to say that, well, you know, there's really no distinction between the mind and the body. The mind and the body are perfectly united. And we know this because the phenomenological analysis of experience is something which you cannot uh, talk about as disembodied, okay? And the sort of Merleau-Ponty type of later phenomenology that emphasizes the body is really not the kind of thing that Husserl was really interested in in the beginning work. In the early work, he's not interested primarily in overcoming Cartesian uh, Cartesianism. He's interested in taking Cartesianism to its logical outcome. And he was interested in the same type of transcendence to essential knowledge and a priori certainty, which somebody who just gives this half-assed, like sort of pseudo Merleau-Pontian analysis of the body is utterly going to miss. So anyway, I think that's about all I have to say here. And uh, thank you so much for watching. I look forward to uh, trying to maybe continue this series uh, with part two tomorrow.